that learning opportunities happen uh, best when learners are given some control over the content and direction of the lesson. And uh, that's exactly what you, as a teacher, are going to do. You're going to provide opportunities for them to take that kind of control. But at the same time, you're going to be present, uh, ever present, to um, respond to those opportunities and give them the language hold that they need. Hello and welcome to ELT Under the Covers Teaching Methodologies Exposed. Today we are looking at possibly the final evolution in communicative language teaching. We're looking at dogma. But first, introductions. I'm Neil of Team Teacher. Hello everybody, it's Professor Rich. Okay, Rich. Dogme. What do you know about it? Have you used it? I have. I've dabbled. I've dabbled. He's but, a dabbler. Um, it's a, yeah, that's just the thing about dogme. I think there's a lot of things about dogme. I think one thing about dogme is um, you, don't see, you don't see it a lot because people don't do it in observed classes. And because you don't see it a lot, it's hard to know what it is it's a unicorn mm. um is that the right word so uh, how, how would you how would you yeah i think it is kind of a unicorn how how would you describe it then succinctly to a, a lay person for me it's So how would I describe it or how would I do my weird version of it, which probably isn't really dogma? You see, it's like two different things. How would I describe what it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be using the student produced, using student emergent language, student guided classroom lesson names that come up from the students um, to, in order to conduct a lesson. So the lesson primarily doesn't use any material and by material we're talking about course books really um other than what comes up from the lesson itself now that's the ideal but actually even thornbury will probably say about you know strips of paper and um this that and the other and board markers so you can write on the board so you know it's not it's not entirely free of kind of external devices but the idea is we're getting away from, oh, I've got this audio, which has some examples of the present perfect. And then we're going to do these pre-scripted activities. And instead, you're kind of going into the class semi-blind. I mean, in a pure version, definitely you're going into a class without really knowing what the language point's going to be and perhaps even what the activity is going to be. And, um, and you'll kind of bring something up some language will come out and then from that, you know, on the spot, you'll kind of move towards some sort of a lesson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's some example lessons, some example lesson ideas that I've done myself and that I've read about that I could talk about. But I don't know if that's something we want to save to later because that's kind of going into a bit more depth on it. Yeah, I, I like I like your explanation, but I think we can go a little bit deeper. So let's uh, cut to a deep dive onto uh, Dogme and then we can explore it a little bit further after. Dogme is a communicative approach to language teaching that encourages teaching without published textbooks and focuses instead on conversational communication among learners and the teacher. It has its roots in an article by the language education author Scott Thornbury. But what is the theory behind it all? Let's have Scott explain. Well, this is the theory. Uh, my argument is, and it's only it's an unproven one, but the fact that the activities were interactive, communicative, personalized, memorable, engaging, etc. And the fact that there were no materials is not coincidental. There are three, as it were, poles, or can there be three poles? There's three 
axes in the classroom. There's the teacher, there's the students, and there are the materials. But typically, the course book, the textbook. You know? And very conventionally and traditionally, the kind of the chain of, or the direction of communication is typically mediated via the materials. In other words, the teacher, through the materials, engages the students. And classically, this would be, good morning class, did you have a nice weekend? Open your books, page 56, Jose, what's the answer to number one? Yeah? So that's the, as it were, classic route. At the expense, often, I think, uh, unfortunately, of the more direct route, which is between the teacher and the students and between the students and each other. Now, this is not to say that the materials are no good, that they should be just if, if all communication is via the materials, it seems to be a shame, particularly in a language class. It might not matter in a math class or a history class or a geography class. In a language class, it seems to be wasting a valuable opportunity for real communication between the people in the room. And that's, after all, what language was designed to do. So what I'm saying is the danger of the kind of, as it were, the scenic route is that it can be, through the materials, it can be the expense of direct communication between the people in the room, which is more memorable, which is more engaging, and which is real language use. That's all. So that's my thesis. There are three main pillars of dogma. One, it's a materials light approach, as in less textbooks and less contrived, inauthentic materials. Two, it's text conversation driven teaching as in authentic materials that promote natural conversation and three it's all about emergent language so dogma considers language learning to be a process where language emerges rather than one where it is acquired language is considered to emerge in two ways Firstly, the classroom activities lead to some collaborative communication among the students. Secondly, the learners produce language that they were not necessarily taught. The teacher's role in this is in part to facilitate the emergence of the language and, for a better word, improvise a lesson or activity around that emergent language. So that was our little uh, deep dive into kind of me trying to define uh, dogma. Um, I kind of want to elaborate a little bit more on that um, before asking you kind of, does that chime with what you've been doing with dogma? But um, the way I kind of see it after doing my research, because I've not really done dogma, uh, well, if I have, I've not, I've not done it with that term in mind, but I kind of see it as like uh, the uh, teaching methodology equivalent of like Aikido. It's the, the parry, the, the, the counter, the, um, <laughs> you know, it's like you're taking all, all the stuff in the class and kind of using it against the 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 students um well not against them but you know it, it's 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 almost akin to magic uh i say um but it needs a, a very very uh experienced magic wielder to actually do it yeah i'm not sure if i like that analogy but no. i see what you're getting at uh, it's yeah i it's can't put my bad. finger on it but yeah it is basically a lot of the things you were saying there are things that I have in my head, especially this idea of working with emergent language, doing away with the materials. It's kind of interesting because I think that video that you got, the, some of the footage there you got, <laughs> yeah, some of the footage you got there of Thornbury, I think, is actually from quite a long time ago. And I wonder how much he's kind of developed the idea since then because he actually seemed quite uh, liberal in the way he was putting it there, sort of saying that, yeah, you know, it's just, we just want to make sure that we don't, um, that the materials don't get in the way mm -hmm. of our authentic communication with our students, which I think these days would be considered a very, very, very light version of dogma. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, my understanding now is that the kind of approach of dogma really is, yeah, literally get rid of your course book, throw it out, get in the classroom and do some stuff with, with, with none of that synthetic material nonsense. So 
and and probably the real approach that teachers should be taking is somewhere in the middle as uh, we sort of heard in our interview with uh, Anthony where he was saying that you know one day you go in you get that feeling in your gut that the lesson's going to suck and uh, you start talking about biscuits and then suddenly you get into a a dogma lesson on biscuits where they designed some biscuits at the end of the lesson sounded great uh, how so, how does it work for you do you know like do you do you just do you get inspired do you get like sucked into this biscuit portal do you know like you you notice a bee in the classroom and you're like oh no i've got an idea ah and then you just like rip off your clothes to sh reveal a dogma lesson that just emerges or something <laughs> how does it work for you yeah i don't think you know for me I think it's very rare that I kind of go in thinking I'm going to do dogma, do dogma. And maybe that's how it's supposed to be. But also, I don't think my version would ever be very pure anyway. It's quite unusual that right from the start of a class, I'll go into something and decide, you know what? Yeah, we are flying by the seat of our pants today and that's it. Normally, there'll be some more direction than that. And I suppose my version of dogma will really be more like if something is not working or if something comes up or if I get a moment of inspiration in a class, then I'll go with that. Mm -hmm. So if the students are particularly struggling with some sort of language point and I just think, oh, wouldn't it be, it be, wouldn't it be great if we did a bit of work on that? And, you know, they, they made a poster about something, you know, some idea came to me and then I would start doing work on it and just talking with them and drawing stuff on the board and giving them that language input and then setting a task and stuff like that. So I, you know, I kind of, I kind of do get the idea. I think it's good that we, it's good that we have someone like Thornbury to kind of put it a bit more, to put it down a bit more in a regulated way, because I think my kind of hurry furry flamboyant whatever the hell I'm talking about way of explaining it and even doing it is not very useful for sort of talking about it, which is why I'm kind of flailing about now and don't really know what I'm what I'm kind of going on about. I have followed someone else's dogma lesson plan before, and that was quite an interesting experience. I think I'd like to do a bit more of that to give me some more ideas of how other people are using dogma. And this was, it was an interesting idea where uh, the idea is you go into a class and you say, right, I'm going to tell you guys about a story, a bit dialogic storytelling. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys a story about something that happened to me on my holiday. I had a holiday last week. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's all I'm going to tell you about it right now. So now, and then you put them in groups and you say, right, I want you to write down on strips of paper questions about my holiday one person from the group comes over, shows me the strip of paper. If the question is correctly formed, then I'll write the answer on the back and send it back to your group. And if it's not correctly formed, then I'll send it back and you have to fix it. And you do that until all the groups have acquired different pieces of information. And then they have to retell your story or they have to tell a story about your holiday. And the point is they all have different bits of information. So they all have a slightly different story to tell about your holiday because they've all asked you different questions. Oh, that's really cool. Ideally. I, I like that. Yeah. yeah, it's fun, right? And it's creative and it's interesting. And you don't need the only thing you need to do to do that class is you need pens and paper. That's it. Yeah. That's okay. all you need. So, so let me kind of pass and segment this out. So we've got the kind of way that you do it um, um, is kind of like you go into a class with a lesson plan but you're holding yeah. a lightning rod and the lightning rod is the the dogma so if you if the lesson plan fails you tr you reach for the rod if you know there's inspiration gets hit by the rod then that gets precedent yeah. so it's kind that's of exactly it kind of like there's, that it, and then there's two possibilities one is that something bombs like crazy or the lesson bombs, or I just go in and I just feel like, you know what, this just seems so boring. I don't want to do this. Yeah. You know, you just, it's because sometimes you don't realize you're just doing your automated planning and then you go into the class and you're like, actually, this was a shit idea, yeah. <laughs> like, you know? Uh, so there's that, uh, in which case I'll, I'll, I'll kind of desperately uh, go in another direction. And the other one is, yeah, like you, you've got a lesson plan and it's quite good, 
but the students just really seem to be into something else or someone in the class says, Oh, you know what? I, my house was on fire one time and the fireman come and rescued me and I almost died. And you're like, shit, that's really interesting. All the students are really <laughs> interested in it. Let's work with that. Let's, let's go on this tangent. Let's, okay. let's go with so it. So it's kind that's of, now the, the you're kind of like a, an improvising, you know, a, a stand up comedian doing crowd work stroke, you know, uh, hit, hit uh the glass in case of emergency kind of thing and then and then the yeah. other one the 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 lesson that you kind of uh that you gave us an example sounds like you kind of go into dogma and all you have really is a seed you have a seed and you don't know how that's going to grow but you know yes you've got an idea that it will become a tree you know you've got you've got a seed that's of it. a tree you just don't know what kind of tree it's going to be something like that um, what... That seems like a pretty good comparison, yeah, of, of those two I'd, things. Approaches. I'm just I'm just hitting you know homers with uh, these these analogies today. Uh, I'm trying to get back my form. Yeah, I... normally your analogies are way off, so this is actually quite. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a broken clock has got to be correct twice a day. Um, I think at <clears> this <throat> point it would be good to actually see a dogma class in action. So. We actually have footage of uh, Scott Thornberry uh, doing doing dog may. Uh, so I wonder if it's going to be we're going to get another uh, variation of this or um, how it's going to be. But I'm I'm very excited to watch mm. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, just 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 before we do, just to sure. go back to my other point about um, lesson obs and how you never see dog may. This is one of the weird things, isn't it? Because for me, dog may is something which. Um, when the way I do it is I go into a class, not necessarily thinking I'm going to do dog me, but mm. then it becomes dog me because something, something happens, which I explained mm. before. Mm -hmm. And to, for me, that's really a natural way of, of, of dealing with that. Yeah. You know, that, that, that seems to me to be the natural, the natural way of, of how to do it. And the thing is like, you're not going to see that in a lesson plan and in a, in a observed lesson, unless you get someone who's got like balls of steel, right? Because to go like off piste in a lesson, mm -hmm. you have to really be able to justify it. Cause the whole point about an observed lesson is that you've spent like way too much time planning the lesson. And therefore you shouldn't be making momentary decisions in class unless there was a problem with your planning. Right. And that's the standard. That's the kind of traditional, thinking about observe lessons and lesson plans, which is why it'd be very difficult to see an emergent dogma lesson. You imagine you've planned this whole lesson on the present perfect, you go in there and then you just go like, at some point in the lesson, you're just like, fuck this fucking lesson plan goes out the window. <laughs> observer's, mon observer's monocle like pops off. <laughs> it starts stuttering. And while well, you start like dogmaing it up, um, you know, I think you'd, you, you, it could be done. But you'd have to be ready to um, give it some welly in in the uh, in the kind of the after the what do you call it the reflection or whatever. Yeah, you'd have to do an extensive kind of debrief, wouldn't you? To just... and then alternate, yeah. and then alternatively, the idea of going into an observe lesson and going dog me is what I'm going to do. Like, how do you how do you put that on a lesson plan? Yeah, you know that can be, that. And it, I know I've heard of people doing it, so obviously it can be done. But that in itself um, prov 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 provides some problems. So I think that's why we never really get to sort of see it. And even what we're about to watch with Thornbury here, we have to bear in mind that he's deliberately doing this to demonstrate dogma. So this is in itself is going to be, you know, it's going to be like the platonic. This is what I imagine it's going to be. It's going to be like the platonic dogma. Mm -hmm. and not necessarily how dogme really is going to emerge the raw dog <laughs> the raw dog <laughs> oh that can be like that can be our version it's like <laughs> dog me oh you're still doing dog me <laughs> come on uh, you'll get there in the end you'll move you'll move on to raw dog <laughs> let's just call it dogging yeah i'll get it we just need to <laughs> we just need to we just need to back for name it we just need to come up with something for r-a-w right and and D O and G as well. <laughs> anyway, sounds good. Raw dogging, <laughs> really awkward winging. Dog Raw mate. dogging <laughs> by ELT under the covers. Yes.
that that's uh <laughs> remember to like share and subscribe and hit that notification bell because we'll be raw dogging you very soon <laughs> but maybe maybe it's time to see uh uh, uh scott doing his his dogging i just started thinking about how like all of our products are gonna have some sort of sexual innuendo name <laughs> like we have a we have like a, a mailing list called like the wet spot or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. okay anyway well my name's scott um what i'm going to do we'll a session which is basically activity focused. This is a teacher a training seminar, so you know he's probably talking a little bit well, more than he would in a, a normal class. We've got time, we'll do some more and talk about that, okay? So, to start with, guessing game. We've played this before, I'm sure you've done. Something I'm wearing, holding, carrying, have with me in the room. Yes, no questions. Starting now. Are you wearing a microphone? I am wearing a microphone, but it's not that that I'm thinking of. You've got to guess the mystery object. It's not my briefcase. Is it on your body? It's not on my body, no. Is it in your pocket? It's not in my pockets. It's not on your feet. It's not on my feet. Is that a, a, a request or is that? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about ability. <laughs> oh, you I dirty dog. <laughs> no, you can't see it, but you will be able to <laughs> when I show it to you. After the class. <laughs> yes. I'm terrible. Question. Did he say it's not on his body? Yeah. It's not a pen. But it's something he's it's wearing. Not it's not on his body. I'm wearing... It's oh, is, he gonna, is it going to be like an Jesus idiom? I'm wearing... Uh, What's an idiom of wear? Wearing a fake smile. It's not a folder, no. Try and get the material it's made of, perhaps. Mm. It's not a piece of paper. Leather. It's not leather. It's metal. It's metal. You can't spend it in a shop, but I know what you're thinking of. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, I doubt it. No, no. It's, no. it's quite <laughs> teacher-centric at this point. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'd have a problem with that. I mean, I think it's going to no spin more, on to no more something teachers, else. <clears throat> no more teacher centric than dialogic storytelling, is it? That's true. I wasn't. It was, no, you could. No, you couldn't. In fact, I didn't buy it. I was given it. Everyone's engaged as well. Mm -hmm. Not really. No, I sentimental about it. It's given it. It's not wearing. Not on my body. Something I'm wearing. <laughs> Yes, you, you can wear it on your person. Oh, you can wear it, but it's, it's not wearing it. It's not a watch, no. It's not a ring. No, is there? No, is it jewelry? It's not a ring. <laughs> it's not a, not a bracelet, no. <laughs> no. no. Please. I'm not, the, I'm not the earring type. <laughs> I'll just check I do have it. Oh, yes, there it is. <laughs> it's a bit unusual, I must admit. You give in? No. <laughs> it's not a necklace. It's a knife. Isn't it Australian? <laughs> it's very similar to a tie clip. It's yeah. a badge. Ah. You call that a badge? You can't actually This is a badge. Get a it's a little um Can you see what's written on it? Hmm. Realia. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. Exactly. Tefl <laughs> China. Do you want to ask me some questions about real questions now? Yes, in fact, this time last year, I was at a conference, and uh, they gave me that badge as part of the kind of conference packet, and that just happens to be still sitting in my um, briefcase. I have no idea. I imagine it means TEFL China. Yeah. <laughs> TEFL as in teaching English as a foreign language. I was talking about similar things I'm going to be talking about in this session, in fact, but to vast 
many, many more people, and it was also being filmed. It was in way, 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 way up in the north of China, near the Korean border. It's a place that doesn't even get a mention in the blue, uh, the um, Lonely Planet Guide to China. <laughs> so I mean, I, I'll ask people who've lived in China. It's a place called Tonghua, and they said, "No, I've never heard of it." But you know, it was it was fun getting there. Anyway, so that's the story of that's the mystery object. I want you to do the same. You know, think of something that you've got on you. Oh, it was a demo. Or you've got a bag and the pants you're wearing. You know? In pairs, two, 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 one group of three, take turns. Yes, no questions. And when you've guessed, <clears> then uh, tell the story about the object, where you got it, how much you paid for it, was it a gift, that kind of thing. Yeah? Same kind of, exactly the same as we do with me. Okay, I'll give you about three or four minutes on that. Off you go. You know what? Uh, I've never actually, I've never seen Thornbury teach before. Yeah. And obviously he's not really teaching, he's kind of speaking to teachers. Uh, which is probably what, what he does most of the time, unfortunately. Yeah. But what I am noticing is I'm getting very warm, fuzzy feelings about his style as a teacher. Yeah. A lot of people, they have a really strong teaching persona. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing from him is, is, see, he's someone who I think has quite a strong persona anyway, mm -hmm. like without teaching persona. He kind of, you know, when you see him talk, he's always like, my name's Scott Thornbury. You know, yeah. kind of has a person persona anyway. But his teaching persona seems to be like really close to his just genuine self. Yeah. And I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Because even even with really good examples of you know, we've seen some examples of really good classes and we still see this kind of it's a bit too kind of ooh, I'm a devil teacher. Ooh, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of <laughs> being being a devil teacher, but he's sort of I don't know. He's he's coming across quite natural there, which is kind of his part of his shtick, isn't it? So, authentic communication. So yeah, Remi yeah it reminds me of Keddy. You know, when we when we when we look at yeah. when we watch Keddy, you know, uh, it does you remind can, me of Keddy. It, as well. it, it's it's Keddy's personality as well. He, he you know he's he, he. I imagine he'd be doing that sort of stuff if he were down at the pub, you know, yeah. and he was outside the classroom. A little like, bit. Right, I mean, like, he, we, just when just we, tell when we me what you're him. saying, Kenny. Stop asking me. <laughs> stop asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll buy. I'll buy you a drink. But um, what drink do you think I'm going to buy? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a surprise, and it's something that you have had before, but it's not your favorite drink. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. No, and, and and he is like that as well, isn't he? Because we had him on the podcast, and again, he's someone who I think is teaching person, pers how he is as a teacher is quite similar to how he is as a person. So uh, I like that a lot. I think that is the way to go. Mm -hmm. I understand, especially why new teachers put on a really big, this I'm someone else persona. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to some extent, it's always going to be a bit, bit different than yourself. But I think the closer you can get it to, just uh, just you and a genuine inter interaction, and have the students still engaged and following and everything. Yeah, it's uh, it's put it, it's really kind of like the the Mark Ullman kind of putting the mm -hmm. the the person first, and I think it's it, it in additionally it's kind of has that uh, element of suggestopedia to it because it's lowering the effective filter. If you if you're generally if you are if you are being genuine and you're not putting on this, I'm the teacher. It can you're not you're not creating that barrier between the two of them. There's a little bit more casuality to it. He's obviously, he's still very in control uh, of the direction of the class, but it doesn't feel like he's um, lording over it. And uh, you know, yeah. I agree. I, I love it. And I, I hope my classes come across in the same way, uh, but it's a little bit more difficult with kids. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my cat's just jumping on me. Right. Let's go. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Hang on. <clears throat> Cats.
you know, watching teachers do this isn't quite um, as interesting. It would be watching students do this. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just noticing from the filming, damn, I wish they did this more in the observed classes we've seen. Because we are, we almost never get to see this. Yeah. Like this is the part of the video they cut. Mm -hmm. And in a, in like an observed class with students, it'd be really interesting to see this bit. Yeah, totally, <laughs> you know? totally. Um. So yeah. So it's 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 nice they've included it. And uh, yeah, I wish more teachers, when they were especially you know yeah in obs obs classes, <laughs> would uh, would show this bit. Ask him a few questions about his sunglasses to get. Uh, ask him if it. Have you done? Both ways. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Sorry. If you have. Wow! I never realised the Australians said, "Say, have you done? Have you done? Yeah. Have you done?" Have you done, Neil? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he's got a very light Australian accent. But um, it, it, you can still tell. It kind of sounds British in a way. Yeah, well, he's he's kind of got that, hello, here I am, I'm Scott Thornbury. Um, <laughs> he's spent like a lot he's of time per with, perpetually spent holding quite a glass a while of brandy. with academia, darling. <laughs> give a speech at Oxford. Um yeah, yeah. You know, the, we're, we're getting we're going to get into something exciting now. I can feel it. Good. Thanks a lot. Okay. Just thinking back on that activity, what level could you do it with? I mean, think, thinking in terms of students. Yeah. I mean, hello. Could you do it with the elementaries that you've got now? Mm -hmm. What will, might the problem be? Yeah, I think so. So vocabulary, I think. The structure, when you think about it, is quite simple. I mean, it's all present tense. It's all is it, can you, etc. You might want to give them, though, some of those questions. And so what I would do, the questions that you were tr asking me at the beginning about the badge, I'll get some of those ones up onto the board. Is it made of, dot, dot, dot. Can you, mm, with it, dot, etc. So they've got those available. Even at relatively high levels, they may have trouble formulating those questions. But once that's out of the way, yeah, I mean, it's not a problem. The problem is going to be the vocabulary because you can't predict that they're going to use the word tattoo or Icelandic or, you know. So what do you do about that? I suppose, yeah. That's true. They could, it, well, if they have any sense, they'll limit themselves to things that they can talk about. Uh huh. And yeah, and you and could. Sort of yeah, you could predict to a certain extent. So you could you could run through some materials. You could run through some items of clothing, some colours, etc. If they needed that, it starts to make the thing a bit top heavy as an activity. Oh, we yeah. do so much pre-teaching that it takes a bit of the fun out of it. Yeah, I like that analysis. It starts to become a bit top heavy. Yeah, sometimes things are a bit top heavy, aren't they? And I, yeah, I, I really, I like that term. I like the way you put that. Yeah, when when, you, when you're dogging, you don't want it top heavy. <laughs> you want when to you're leave... raw dog. <laughs> if you've got a raw dog, you just want to. You just want the top. I, I'm just going to refer people back to our intro music. So you know, this, <laughs> this you you know what you were clicking. <laughs> Yeah, no, yep. it's great analysis. Absolutely spot on. And I, I love it. It's kind of like he's giving a little bit of a dialogic space in that, you know, he's allowing the the teachers to go through that process of uh, discovery <clears throat> of, you know, uh, working out what the problems might be. And then him, you know, basically just guiding them saying, yeah, hey, yeah, this is this is right. This is also a problem. It's top heavy. Mm. Uh, I wonder if he'll give like a solution, though as well or it'll just kind of leave it hanging yeah i kind of want to see i want to see something and i think he's got something up his sleeve the other thing is as a teacher you can just be scooting around if the class is not too big supplying the vocabulary as it comes up especially um. if you speak that's really interesting to see him to hear him say that because i've heard someone describe that before as feeding things in mm -hmm. feeding vocabulary in and it's something that i 
definitely do quite a bit mm -hmm. and i like it mm -hmm. but i've ha i've had people criticize it quite heavily um, really? as sort of oh you're sort of interrupting the student conversation and sometimes you gotta, too you gotta give a dog a, a bone and, and all this kind of stuff and yeah to the extent where it's kind of like oh if the students are like talking then the teacher should be like invisible almost um which i don't agree with at all mm. but yeah I, I, it's really interesting to see him um talk about that talk about feeding vocabulary in yeah that's uh that's great acts a kind of dictionary. Um, but I know that is the problem with it, I think. I've got a, a friend here who teaches German, and he does things like that with elementary classes, but he has them in groups of three. So two people are playing the game. When they don't know the word, they just substitute their Spanish. Okay, so they'll use the Spanish word, but they try to play the game in German. The third person notes down all the words in Spanish that come up, and then after the game's over, they look them up in the dictionary. So the flu the, the momentum of the game's not broken. That's awesome. I love that activity. I love that idea of, of 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 just actually saying to the students, you know what? If you don't know something, and if you've got like shared students with L1, if you don't know something in English, just say it in your own language. But there's gonna be another student there who writes down all of the Spanish words you use. And then at the end of the activity, at the end of the activity, you're going to look them all up. Mm -hmm. So we're not intruding because normally what happens is two students speaking, blah, 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 blah. And then, oh, they want to look something up. And it's like phone comes out, conversation stops, and they're on the internet. And then like, oh, it's this. Oh, that. Oh, okay. Oh, that. And it takes about, it takes about three minutes and completely disrupts the flow of the conversation. But this idea of having someone else there and just say, no, no, you just say the word and move on. Mm -hmm. and then get to the end of your interaction and then go back through them all. It's almost got that kind of slightly TBL type thing of like you're kind of realizing the words you don't know and then looking them all up. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. Mm -hmm. It's good. I want more of this. I want more. Where can I get more of this, Scott? <laughs> Do I need to... Is this is this where it becomes blatantly obvious that I haven't read any of his books? <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, I think I read a chapter from Teaching Unplugged. Oh no, I've read I've read his um, How to Teach Vocabulary, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the main one I've read anyway. Two languages, but there is a kind of teaching point at the end where they can then get the dictionaries out, consult, and then they take it. Then the other two do it. The other one takes the sort of turn of noting down the word, and it seems to quite work quite well. <clears throat> of course, when you get to the telling the story of the object, what are you into then? Grammar-wise, exactly. When did you get your tattoo? Where did you find it? So how long have you had it? By definition, you're into the past with story. So that sort of restricts the level again a bit. But that, in fact, is the most interesting part of the activity, really. I mean, it's nice that Kate's got a tattoo. It's much more interesting to know why, where, when, how long, etc. Okay, let's move on. Um... Okay, so, you know, obviously not... A perfect uh, example because it was the teachers uh, there acting as students but I think it was a really good representation um, and kind of quasi explanation uh, of how dog bay kind of works and you know it's demonstrated and you can kind of see him kind of like break it down as well uh, and I think it's great he's obviously uh, a really adept teacher yeah that's the thing i got mainly out of that is some of the insightful comments from scott thornbury mm -hmm. i don't think that actually showed us what dogma is though so i think for me that just showed us like a setup mm -hmm. but didn't it didn't it didn't take us beyond the setup mm -hmm. like yeah that that that's that that's like how to start a dogma class yeah you know a pure dogma class where you're going in without materials how to start it but it doesn't sort of move on because really he and he discussed sort of s stages and things that you might need to teach and mm -hmm. options but um you know not that extensively just give us a few oh you could go around the teacher and fill, feed things in or you could pre-teach but then it becomes top heavy um but but obviously you would need some of that and then for me you're also going to need because that's just your start you need an end as well so you need a 
some sort of a big task where they're going to make use of whatever. I feel like there does need to be like something else for, on top of that. that, that so <clears throat> it's it was one of the qualms that I had with, with Dogme was I just, I, I can see it as, the way that you do it is like a kind of a, a gap fill or, you know, something to lean into that's more interesting, etc. cetera. Um, but on a broader curriculum or syllabus, I, I just, I, I have no idea how it works. Luckily, uh, we actually have a clip from uh, Scott uh, that kind of breaks that down a little bit, but a little bit better. So we can kind of have an understanding of if we were to just use dog may as uh, you know, just, our methodology going forward for like a whole course so maybe we can have a look at that how does dogma work let's have scott explain um and if we take as our basic uh, assumption that a dogma approach doesn't use a textbook as such this doesn't necessarily mean that there's no syllabus um a syllabus can come from anywhere uh, but nor does the fact that there's no syllabus in the sense that there's a list of pre-selected uh, items that are to be taught, um, nor does that mean that there's necessarily no structure or organization or no curriculum as such. The learners are consulted at every stage of the process, not just about what they want to learn, but how they want to learn it. Um, now, this obviously assumes all sorts of uh, uh, degrees of sophistication on the part of the learners, etc., and a very clear understanding on their part of what their needs might be. Nevertheless, it is an option, uh, and I think a dogma approach uh, would consider that seriously, say, well, um, you decide, or we'll decide together, we'll negotiate some topics, some themes, uh, and then we'll renegotiate them as we go along. As I say, because there's no syllabus in the traditional sense doesn't mean to say there needn't be any structure, although the teacher may have to work a little bit harder to uh, involve the learners in uh, either negotiating the structure or identifying the syllabus as it emerges. But essentially, it is an emergent syllabus. It's one that comes out of the learners' needs, interactions, etc., in the process of learning. That's about, so that's about how you would implement it as a syllabus. And that sort of makes sense if you wanted to go like a dogma syllabus route. Yeah, you'd have to use the the, 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 the idea that it's going to be a an emergent syllabus, mm -hmm. which of course poses all kinds of issues. Not so much from my perspective, but from an institutional perspective, there's just no way that they're going to let people do that. Um, you know. How are we going to do? How are we going to carry on with our Cambridge exams if everyone's doing emergent syllabuses? <laughs> Syllabi, I don't know. Yeah. So, but I can see where I can see where the rationale comes from, the justification, and um, yeah, I mean, I agree. It'd be nice. It'd be lovely to have emergent syllabus. Uh, syllab syllabi. Syllabi. Syllab syllabi. Syllabi. It'd be it'd be great to have emergent syllabi. Um. Or well, I think maybe the issue is more with us than with the 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 example dot the example class which is you know obviously it's not a proper full example um in that we we have this idea so ingrained from us from our celta days of kind of like having a start middle and end you know story has start middle and end we've got like a, a esa a ppp but when you think about it with with dogma it's it's like production <laughs> it's or it's all everywhere all at once at the same time so it's kind of like well we've got this activity they're doing the activity and then is that the end of the class? Is 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 that kind of what you're thinking? Like, how do they tie up the class or whatever? Because it just seems like they they speak, they're communicating, and isn't that, that what I'm point? what I'm thinking? What I'm thinking is they have to join another group with another couple of students, and then they have to tell they have to tell each other the story of two other people and where what they're wearing and the, and the, all of the things they found out about those, those people. And then even, I'd even want to do something from there. I mean, maybe I'm going a bit, 
sort of tasky with it. That's the thing. It's the way that I teach. And I'm sort of thinking that, you know, at the end, I kind of want them to um, draw a picture of a character that's wearing like four different things from people around the classroom Mm -hmm. and has like that story. And they have to write a paragraph about who that character is and why they have those things. I mean, the, the way I was thinking about it was, okay, here's this one activity uh, and that activity can be done for the rest of the class and there's multiple different ways that you can go down doing that. You can do as you sway, as you say, uh, you know, like you swap and, you know, they, they, they do it your way where they add to whatever people or you just swap completely and they just do it with another different partner um or they do uh like presentations to the class uh, about an object and that so they they're not the person that has the object is not asked directly it's asked they are asked by uh the questions are asked to the person that has to remember and explain about this object for that other person that's holding the object something you know i think there's a load a bunch of different ways that you can go with it and i think <clears throat> i think that's the that's the point is it is it not that it's less about kind of like where you want to go with it and more of how how do you think it's going to benefit the students uh do they and that's where it kind of goes into my esa mindset of like well okay they're they're doing great here um well let's just keep you know on the on the activate let's just keep them you know practicing or we'll just switch them out and do that and you know if it gets boring we'll uh i'll come up with something else but if they're struggling well okay then maybe i need to um as i'm spot checking around the students you know i'm collecting some vocabulary that i can board and we can kind of go over go over that and you know see where we go with that you know um and yeah or, or yeah or if it just gets boring um can can i how can i switch it up and go with the engage so i that's the way i kind of see it but um i can really think about dogma in the terms of who can do it uh, i think that's the biggest problem that i have with with dogme uh, i just can't see a new teacher being able to do it um you know it's it needs that experience i don't know how much experience i, I wouldn't like to just put an arbitrary number of years or classes taught on, on it but it needs that person needs to have kind of like the a bank of activities or tasks or you know like um, situations that they can draw upon to be able to do this uh, i don't know how you would uh, do it just you know straight off the bat is it possible i don't know maybe but i think it's i think it's <laughs> probably not something that you would prescribe prescribe for most sort of new teachers mm-hmm. saying that I wonder what I wonder what the experience level is of these teachers that he's talking to right now. Is this a Celta course or a Dip Delta yeah, course? Yeah, that's true. So that's that'd be interesting. But it, I think I agree with you, and I think that it's something better to ease into, kind of dip your toes in the water gradually, because you do need to build up the confidence. And every, even experienced teachers are going to have moments of panic where you think, oh God, what the hell am I going to do next? And you do not want to be in that situation where all the, where you've stopped the class and everyone's looking at you or the activity kind of winds up and suddenly you can't think of what you're doing next. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, and that obviously happens to all of us, but it's definitely not where you want to be as a teacher. Yeah. Because it can start to become blatantly obvious that you don't know what the hell you're doing then. So, <laughs> um, so you definitely don't want to, you don't want to be in that situation. And so I agree with that. And I think I, I, I'm not even sure that Scott Thornbury would necessarily argue that new teachers should be going straight into dogma more instead of just arguing that that's just the general direction that he wants DLT to take. The other thing I would say is I think you made a key point there about the boring, like when it gets boring, that's when you sort of change things up. That's kind of a guiding principle that I use. And it's one of the things I indicated before about when I would actually use a sort of dogme, pseudo dogme activity or t- 
turn my class into a dogma hybrid. It would be in a situation one of the one of the trigger points would be when things get a bit a little bit boring, and that's really the the the, the thought I had about that activity at the start is that that activity is going to get boring. Like even just in just an hour class, but certainly in a 90 minute class, you're not going to spend 90 minutes asking people, is it a watch? Is it metal? Is it cloth? Okay. It's your necklace. Great. Where did you get it? Oh, why did it, you know, that, that'll be interesting for a bit. It's going to get really boring Mm -hmm. soon, soon, soon enough. So that was kind of my thought. It's kind of like, well, there's got to be something that goes on from that. And you know, you can't just switch to another different, totally different activity. Mm-hmm. Like you want it to be a kind of consistent class because you know, you want to reinforce. Yeah. Yes. In conversation, learning will take place, but you want to do everything you can to give the students the opportunity and give the language opportunity to take root in the students, the lang- the new language that they're learning. Mm-hmm. So whatever method you use. And again, I want, I want to know more of these little tricky, these little tricks, you know, like having a third student listen and then uh, provide translations at the end of the conversation or whatever, you know, stuff like that sounds really cool. I want to know more stuff like that because that's how the language goes in. And then what I want to know is what's the Mm follow-up and, you know, is that just down to the teacher? You have to be skilled enough to think of a follow-up. In that case, we are then talking about experienced teachers who, have ideas of, you know, end of class of, of kind of productive production tasks, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, I, that... And for me, it's, uh, I, I I would like to have seen kind of where he would have gone with that uh, in the class. But I, I think it were, it, it's difficult for him to say uh, when he kind of, do you know, like when he asked them about well, what kind of the what are the problems that you could see with doing that activity, uh, and he, there's all those different branches that he can cover. I kind of feel like it's the same way of what he can do next. You know, does he, uh, you know, s- swap the students? Does he have the students go? Does he come up with an activity that's based around that emergent language? So do you know, like, does he dr- get them to draw pictures and they they have to either describe the pictures or ask questions about those pictures or i i don't know there's it just feels like there's an open road in front of you and you you can go whichever way you want to um so uh, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way it's just these tidbits that could make things go a little bit smoother um but overall i just I, I really want to again re-emphasize that how uh, impressed I am with uh, Scott Thornbury, just kind of with, with his uh, teacher teacher presence uh, and his teaching. You know, I, I he he has what I see as kind of like the 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 that genuine authentic persona that you know we all aspire to have the 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 the, that natural aura of yeah whatever whatever happens in this class we'll um yeah we'll we'll deal with it and um we're we're gonna we're we're gonna get you learning don't worry about it you know it has like a like a michelle thomas just you know it's it's i i'm cool i'm a a cool uh cool cucumber and everything is under control. You don't have to worry about doing anything of the learning. Yeah, it's right. it's all it's all good. It's all it's all gold. It's all gold. You know. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Scott, if you're watching, um, we would absolutely love to have you on the show and you know, maybe you can get into uh more details and elaborate on some of those tidbits um that uh were were so uh wonderful. Um that you pointed out during that class and you know if you want to share uh, any further f- thoughts on the evolution of uh, dogma or elt or just you know your guiding principles for teaching please uh, let us know and you know if you're watching this um please write a comment uh, below and um, let us know what you think of dogma have you used it uh, how, how has it worked out for you in class you know is it something you could see using you know let us let us know and uh, as always 
remember to like, share and subscribe. Uh, and remember to hit the notification bell because we have more Dogmate videos in the pipeline. And I'm going to leave it to you, Rich, to take us home uh, with your final thoughts on, on Dogmay and what you want to leave people um, with, uh, you know, maybe even get their wheels spinning. Well, I'd, I'd absolutely be interested in anyone out there who's doing, who's doing Dogmay. Uh, again, as I say, you know, it has that unicorn feel about it that it's the kind of mystical, interesting, exciting thing everyone talks about and then you never actually see. And obviously, Anthony is someone who does it, who we interviewed recently. And uh, it was interesting speaking to him about the way he does it. So it's definitely really fascinating. Like, really, if you're out there and you use Dogme, and I think something that would be really cool is if, you know, you have a video of yourself doing Dogme, you could send that to us at eltundercovers at gmail.com. And we would love to do a little react to that. So we would love to to see any examples of people doing dogma in the classroom because it is super cool. As for getting your wheels spinning, I think what I would say is if you are someone who's watching this and I mean, first of all, if you've watched this far, then this is not going to be you. But if you're someone who's watching this and you're like, oh, this is just totally completely outside of my teaching framework. There's no way I'm ever going to do something like that. Then I think more than anything, you need to try it. Mm. But of course, I think those people would have clicked off by now. Um, if you're on the hand, someone who's really excited about it and maybe has sort of dabbled with it, or you know, maybe you kind of you kind of really like the idea of dogma, and then you kind of just dip your toe in every now and again, mm -hmm. then maybe you know, maybe it's time to put the maybe it's time to to get the whole leg in, you know, maybe it's time to to really <laughs> try, really just go out there and try a dogma because it was it was really interesting for me as someone who does dip my toe in. It was really interesting for me to just kind of go into a class with a, as a dog class, doing the thing I, I ta talked about with the story and the, and the strips of paper and everything. And um, it definitely didn't go as well as it could have, but it was a really interesting activity. And I would like to try it again. Mm -hmm. And at some point I am going to try it again and it's going to get refined and refined. And that's what happens, isn't it? And you build yourself up and you become more confident and you become more confident with the method. So, you know, and dog really has that about it as well. It has that thing of like, you know, are you ready? It's like, it's like taking a, a cold shower in the morning, isn't it? It's like, yeah. get up, you turn on the cold shower, and you're just like, oh, God, am I going to do a cold shower today? Why don't I just have a normal shower? It's what I'm comfortable with. It's easy. Oh, but I know that there's benefits from having a cold shower. And, you know, when you go in and you do your cold shower, you know, maybe you can only last 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Maybe you scream like a little girl, but <laughs> you, but you come out feeling great. So that's really what we have to do with Dog Me. If you're looking for more information uh, from myself, uh, you can go to teamteacherchina.com. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of materials, PowerPoints that you can use instantly in the classroom. We've got a Team Teacher China YouTube channel where we have videos teaching you how to use those uh, materials. Team Teacher English where we put those materials into a, a video form for self-study. And Team Teacher Baby where I take my experience as a teacher and put that into parenting. And go to YouTube the Conference Professor or Rich to see some English teaching you can catch me weekly live streams on oxford online english youtube channel oh and also you can you can do a youtube search for pog space uk and you would get my alpha version of my new gaming channel which actually just have some trial content on there at the moment you can email us here at elt under the covers at gmail.com if you have anything you'd like to contribute to the show smash that like button share and subscribe and, and watch 100 of the video and don't exactly. click off thank you <laughs> bye